Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome back to another uh, Gateway Church online service. Uh, for those of you uh, who are watching us on Facebook, uh, a big uh, welcome to you. Uh, and thank you, uh, Josh and Rian, uh, for your input this morning, just before our service on our Facebook page. Uh, so this morning, we are very, very excited as we, uh, young people, yes, you're right, I'm including myself there, guys, uh, at least for some few years, <laughs> uh, we are having this um, great opportunity to be a blessing uh, to your lives this morning. Uh, for those who has been with us uh, uh, for the past few weeks, uh, would know uh, we've been uh, looking at uh, different Bible characters, and today we will uh, carry on looking at another very important Bible character. So um, this morning, we're looking at the character of David. Um, I mean, you're going to hear three talks um, about the life of David and some specific points in that. Um, you're going to hear about how David defeated a giant, how he was chosen to be king of Israel, and how God did amazing things for him, even though um, he wasn't what people expected. Um, so David is one of the greats of the Old Testament, um, but yet he still messed up and he still made mistakes just like we all do. Um, I just want to quickly read a few verses from um, Psalm 51, um, where David's crying out to God um, after he'd sinned. Um, it's verses 10 to 13 of Psalm 51. It says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach my, then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Um, I love how you can really see David's sincerity in this passage. You know, he's crying out to God saying, Lord, I choose you over everything else. You give me so much more and so much greater things than anything that this world could offer. He says, Lord, I want to stay in your presence. And he says that, Lord, because you are so good, I want to bring more people to know you. How cool is that? Um, it's, it's because of David's desire for God's heart and sincerity in seeking his forgiveness that David is described as a man who is after God's own heart. Hi, guys, I'm just going to um, read uh, 1 Samuel 16 to you now. Uh, now, the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel said, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to him. What's wrong, they asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord didn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord, he looks at the heart. Then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forwards and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shimea, but Samuel said, neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel, but Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of them. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. 
So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him, upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. I'm going to hand over to Ellie now to speak to us. Thank you, Claire. Um, hi, everyone. So today I was asked to speak about the part of David, which the part of David's story, which Claire has just read out for us. And initially, after reading it, you sort of think, oh, well, what am I going to put it? What am I going to do a talk on? Because it's literally just um, Samuel going to David and saying, you're going to be king. And I think there's so many stuff like that in the Bible where you just look at it and it's like, oh, well, that's just this happening but if you read more into it like it actually has so much more meaning and significance and amazing points about it that you can apply to our lives so if we have like a recap of what's going on in this chapter so the people of Israel wanted a king and God initially gave them Saul and Saul was great but then things went wrong and he disobeyed God and God said well we need a new king so God sent Samuel to find a new king and he tells them there's a man in Bethlehem called Jesse and one of his sons will be the king now Jesse has eight sons and he brings each of them to Samuel and every time Samuel's like yes God this is going to be the king this is him and each time God's like no sorry you're wrong on to the next one until God sees seven of them and all of them he's just rejected and Samuel says he doesn't give up he trusts that God has told what God has told him and that one of these one of Jesse's sons will be king and he says to Jesse are these all of your sons and Jesse says no there's David but he's out watching the sheep now I don't entirely know why Jesse hasn't invited David to the sacrifice but I've got two older brothers and they're quite a bit older than me so when I was younger like they would often do things without me because they were older, they could, and I sometimes, quite often, would probably get quite annoyed that they'd gone off without me. So to imagine having seven siblings and your father all go off to this sacrifice, which, like, I'd probably call it a party. It's not a party, but it's like they're all going off and doing something together. Like, I'd be, I'd be annoyed if I wasn't invited to that. So then, I guess, I was thinking, why isn't David invited? David's own father didn't even think to bring David and maybe at this point Jesse didn't know that they were going to tell Sacrifice to be king but even if he didn't know that this was about who was going to be king he still didn't invite David to the sacrifice so clearly I don't want to assume things but he can't be that bothered about David and then even when Samuel asks have you got any more sons he says yeah but He's out, he's out looking after the sheep. He's, he's busy. He's got important things to do. It almost sounds like Jesse's making an excuse and he's saying, oh, you don't need David. He's, he's not going to be king. It's not going to be him. So even David's father doesn't think that David's king material. Now that's what hurts. But we're going to give Jesse the benefit of the doubt and see that David is really extremely busy and he is looking after the sheep. So this means that David's a shepherd. Now, I, I don't know much about shepherds in those times, obviously, but I know that being a shepherd in those days, it wasn't exactly the equivalent to being CEO of a major company or a famous footballer. These shepherds, they were the outcasts of society. They were given a job that no one else really wanted in, in those times. I don't know anything about shepherds these days. Maybe they're really cool people. But in those times, they weren't much. They weren't the brightest people. And David was one of them. So then back to the story. Jesse brings David to Samuel. And one thing we know about the Bible is the Bible's not exactly really descriptive. If I was going to put it in for like an English assessment, it would get top marks on the plot and the content, but not for descriptive language. It would probably be a bit lower on those marks. But um, the one thing that we are told about David is that he's dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And that's great, fair play to David, who, who doesn't want to be called handsome? But when we think of a king, is the initial first qualities that we think of in a king that we would want him to be handsome? Now, thanks to Disney movies, yes, definitely, we all imagine handsome kings. But in reality, in those days, you'd want a king who off the first look, you'd want him to be 
tall and strong and big and powerful. None of that is said about David. But who cares because he has beautiful eyes, right? So that's David. He's not seen as first choice to be king. His family didn't have a really high status. His own father doesn't even seem too bothered about him. He is an outcast shepherd, but he has beautiful eyes. And despite all of the reasons that suggest to us that David was not the preferred choice to be a king, God chooses David anyway, and Samuel anoints David to be king. And this is a bit of a spoiler. Sorry for whoever's speaking later on, but David goes on to be known as one of Israel's greatest kings. So he's literally, no one thinks he's going to be king. He has no, from what we're told, qualities to make you think, yes, he'd be a great one. But he's still chosen by God. So why is David chosen to be king? So when Samuel looks at the first brother and he thinks, yes, this must be him. God replies in verse seven, saying, the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We don't know what God saw in David's heart, but he saw something and only he can see it. And he knew that David was the man for the job because God can see in David's heart that this is who he can be. He sees everything that like that everything that he can be in the future. God's decision wasn't based upon family status. It was because of David's humble trust in God. The truth is, we aren't all going to be chosen to be kings and queens or even princesses, and I have to learn that the hard way. But as long as we trust God and listen to him, just like David did, God's chosen amazing plans for our lives, and they, they can be so much more amazing than what we or anyone else can imagine. And it doesn't always come in big positions of power, like being a king. God chooses in like so many different plans for people in the Bible. In this passage alone that Claire read, he was not only choosing David to be king, but he was also choosing Samuel to tell David that he was going to be king. So he had a completely unique and different plan for Samuel's life, along with this probably many other things that Samuel did. And in the same way that he has a plan for Samuel and David, he has a plan for each and every one of our lives and all of us he's chosen a unique plan and has amazing things for us and you might not think that you're important or special enough for God to choose you for anything and you might have already heard from God something that he wants you to do but think that you're not good enough or you can't you can't do it but but you you can like God has God can see you and he sees everything that you're capable of Look at David, he probably thought the same thing, was probably scared, but there he is being anointed to be king, when, even when no one else thought that he could. So just looking at that verse again, the Lord doesn't see things the way that you see them. People judge by outward appearances. The world and society has taught us things like our po- appearance, our popular- popularity, and our wealth define us and matter, but they don't. God determines what we're going to do with our lives and us as well, as long as we trust him. And then it again carries on in verse 7, for the Lord looks at the heart. God knows your heart and he sees you for who you are and what you can be. Like We're chosen by God for amazing things. Imagine how doubtful and scared David must have been to have a person that, I'm going to guess he doesn't know, just come up to him and tell him that one day he's going to be king. Now it took years and years for this to happen, And David went on and messed up majorly quite a few times, but God still chose him to be king. David wasn't who anyone expected to be king. If it had been up to man, then David would never have been king. But God saw David's heart and saw that David trusted him and chose him. He chose, he's, sorry, he's chosen a plan for his life. And if we have the same trust in God and listen to God, then he's got an amazing plan for us as well. Okay. Thank you. Oh, this, this is a tall guy. Oh my gosh. Wait, stop. Um, oh, I covered it with my finger like an idiot. <laughs> Dave, hey, Dave, what are you doing? Just finishing Psalm 23. Okay, cool. Um, you can write songs later. Your brothers are out killing some Philistines. Can you bring them some food? Yeah. All right. Of course, Dad. Cool. Respect your parents. See you later. Uh, don't, please don't die. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
What are you doing? What are you doing? Dad sent me with some food. Huh? Dominoes? Not quite. Come on. What's going on? Well, you see that like pretty tough guy. He's big, big guy. And like, you know me and your brother, we're like. Strong. Who dares to challenge me? But, like, oh! Go, 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 go! Hmm. Song. Hey yo, D to the A to the V I D. What's happening, my G? Stay safe. Thank you. <laughs> I just finished writing one of my psalms for you. Hey yo, let's hear it. Let's hear it. David in the place to be. Anybody wanna fight, they gotta go for me. But forget hey, forget yeah. that. I just got back from seeing my brothers at the battlefield. Yeah, how are they doing? They're okay. Okay. I just saw this giant. His name's Goliath. Yeah, probably a big thing. I think I'm a Goliath of a man, you know. I think I can take him. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. respect my view. Right, uh, you're a pretty small guy, I'm not gonna lie. So, uh, here. Check, uh, check this on, right? Nah, uh, pack some heat as well. Take him, take him, go, go. Uh, not thank, go down there. I didn't mean that. Thank you, my king, but I don't, I don't think I need this. Nah, it's not looking good, is it? I think, I think all I need is the power of God. Yeah. I, I, I respect that. I respect that. I mean, if if you will it, I got faith in you, bro. Stay safe. I should do. I can take him. Yeah. Yeah. God, this man is much stronger than me and he's much bigger than me. But I know that I can do anything through your power and I will be protected by you. <laughs> oh! Yeah! Woo! David, my guy! <laughs>those videos with the boys because like you can see us all cracking up on the side and then everyone else just so utterly bemused the whole time beautiful. <laughs> anyway <laughs> um as you probably gathered i'm gonna be talking about the story of david and goliath and um i'm sure this is a story we're all probably very familiar with you know sunday school favorite and even outside the church the general story is super well known uh, you know, David is, is this small boy who stands up to this giant who's been bullying his people. And although David is small, well, I say small, he was probably about 15 at the time, but half the time in Sunday school, he seemed to be about five or six, which was, which was funny. But anyway, <laughs> um, David is the underdog and he beats Goliath. And that's why we love this story. It's a classic underdog, good versus evil type story. And it's called cool It Happened. But I think when we take a deeper look into the story, the whole perspective changes. David had complete trust in God and God was with him. Therefore, when David goes to take Goliath, it's not really a small boy taking on a huge man. It's a huge man taking on David and the creator of the universe. So I guess it's still an underdog story, except the underdog never stood a chance. You know, some translations of the Bible say Goliath was six foot nine, others say nine foot nine, but it doesn't really matter. Goliath could have been 200 foot nine and it still wouldn't have done, it still wouldn't have been a match for God. But that's only because David had complete and utter trust in God from day one. You know, David was taking on lions and bears before he was even old enough to pick his GCSEs. And never once in 1 Samuel 17 does David doubt for a second that God has his back. And it's with that unwavering faith that God used David to do incredible things. And there's something else I want to pick up on in 1 Samuel 17, which is uh, verse 16 which says, For 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Uh, 40 days is interesting because it's used so many times in the Bible. You know, Moses was on Mount Sinai for 40 days. Noah was in the ark for 40 days. Jesus was tempted in the desert for 40 days. There's so many examples. And the thing that usually links the biblical 40-day periods is testing. And I think that definitely applies here. You know, every day, Goliath came up taunting the Israelites, making fun of God, and literally asking someone to come fight them, and no one did. And it's not as if there was no incentive. If one of the Israelites beat Goliath, they would become a hero, bring honor to God, be given great wealth by the king, get to marry his daughters, 
<laughs> and uh, and the story would be taught in Sunday school for the next three thousand years. So I'd do it. Well, maybe I wouldn't do it, but maybe I would. Who knows? <laughs> uh, despite all this, fear held each and every one back of them, every one of them back for forty days. And I think this fear is rooted in simply a lack of faith. Uh, if any of those Israelites had a heart full of faith and fully believed God would be with them in the battle, I think they would have beaten Goliath just as easily as David did. It's like God was testing their faith for 40 days, but none of them were up for it. Uh, this fear that's rooted in a lack of faith holds us back as well. Everything we fear can be traced back to a subconscious doubt that God isn't really there for us. I think what we need is the childlike faith Jesus teaches about, with no doubt that God's behind us fully. When we put all of our trust in him, there is no giant this world can present that stands a chance. I think at the end of the day, the story of David and Goliath is a teaching of faith and what we can do with it. We're probably not getting into fights with giants on a daily basis unless unless you wind up James or something like that. But um, we are probably dealing with our own Goliaths, uh, something we just can't seem to get past in our head. But with faith, we can be anything. And I mean that it may not be today. It may not be this week. It may not be this year. But if you look, but if you let God work with you and through you, Goliath will fall. Mic drop. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. So I'm Tom, and today I'm going to be reading two Samuel's verses, or two Samuel's five, verses one to five. All the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said. We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people, Israel, and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to the King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David, king of Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king and reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judith seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned over all of Israel and Judith 33 years. So why was David chosen? Well, first off, why did Israel want a king? Well, Israel wanted a king because they wanted someone to judge them someone to fight beside them but what they didn't well they wanted to be like all the other nations at that time they didn't realize that Yahweh God was supposed to be their judge God was supposed to be their king second how was David selected well the prophet Samuel was sent by God to anoint the son of Jesse as king of Israel and he anointed David, the youngest of his brothers. When Samuel anointed David, Saul was actually still king, which could be seen as a slight problem. But David respected Saul and God's anointment over him so much that he did not take the throne. He did not take the crown. He waited until God gave him the go-ahead until it was the time for him to be king. Okay, well, so why was David chosen? Why was he selected? Well, David was chosen um, because he had a good heart. We see this throughout his time. He had a good heart. It wasn't because of any great feats that he had achieved. It wasn't because he was, like, physically strong or... You know, he was very intelligent. No, he didn't have any flashy characteristics, personality traits. He was a good guy. He had a good heart. That's why he was chosen. God doesn't look on the outward appearance. He looks on what's inside. And finally, what can we learn from this? Well, going back to Elijah... And the whisper in the wind, more specifically, we can see that God works in subtle ways, ways that we usually don't expect. 
Nobody expected God to work through David, the weakest, the youngest. He was the most. He wasn't exactly the uh, person that everyone thought would be the man for the job. But God thought he was. God will use anyone, regardless of who they are. It doesn't matter who you are. God will use you. And if you're weak, he'll probably use you. (laughs) It's more likely he'll use you. He uses those who we don't expect. He uses those who we look down upon. He uses those who we laugh at. Who others laugh at. Those are the ones he picks. It's never somebody who everyone thinks it's going to be. It's always the one who's unlikely. God will work for the weakest. And he'll work through you when you are at your weakest. Because that's when you need God to be strong. Many of us right now are in a time of waiting. And if we look back on the story of David, we'll see that he too had to wait. He had to wait till God gave him the go-ahead, till the time was right. He didn't rush things and try to take the throne from Saul. He respected God's anointment over Saul and his decision and waited. All All we have to do is put our faith in him. Well, how excellent was all that, friends? Oh my goodness. You know how proud I am of all those young people? They've done so well. I'm very pleased to see what you guys have done. That was really good. Um, so I'm gonna warn you, I have a bit of developed a bit of a reputation for going over my time when I speak because I talk a lot. So right now I'm starting a stopwatch right now, and I have three minutes. When that hits three minutes, I'm gonna stop talking, or I'm not, or I'm gonna keep talking. We're gonna see how this goes. All right, ready? Ready, set, go. So the whole overarching theme. Um, of what we're trying to do today was the phrase, David was a man after God's own heart. So we want to look at what does it mean to be a person that is after God's own heart? How do we be men and women that are after God's heart? It's kind of a difficult thing to consider. Um, David was a sinful man, yet scripture still says he was a man after God's own heart. He did incredible things for the Lord, but he also did terrible things that the Lord was not very pleased to see. But still, he was considered a man after God's own heart. How can this be? Well, we can look at the fact that we're all sinners as well, not just David, all of us, me, you, everyone. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I'm sure you've all heard that before. And we all know our own sinful failures. And the Bible clearly shows us the sinful failures of David. Um, I mean, we were talking about the wonderful things about David, but he he did some bad stuff too. I won't go into details, but he wasn't perfect. Um, But still, in 1 Samuel 13, 14, and in Acts 13, 22, we can see the Bible calling David a man after God's own heart. So if a sinful person like like David, even though he was great, he was still sinful, if a sinful person like David can be called someone after God's own heart, surely we can too. But how? That's That's what we need to know. How can we be somebody after God's own heart? even though we're all sinners. Um, what did David do that that made him a man after God's own heart? Well, he did with God what a human would do with another human when they're seeking after their heart. So what do you do with other people when you're seeking after their heart? When you want to develop a relationship, a friendship with somebody, what do you do? Um, David recognized the ways that he had hurt God or done things against God, his sin, and he confessed it to the Lord. You can see that in Psalm 51. He was honest with God. We do that with each other. We're honest with each other when we want to seek each other's hearts. He wanted to love the things that God loved. So we try to do that with others as well. You have a good friend. You want to learn to love the things that they love as well. Um, So uh, David wanted to search after. He wanted wanted more love and grace and mercy and selfless actions in his life because that's what God loves to see. He wanted to serve God. He wanted to do what it is that, that God would ask of him. He wanted to he wanted to seek his will for his life. He wanted to go God's way, not his own way. Um, even though he messed up and he did things that God doesn't like, he asked for forgiveness and he carried on growing in his relationship with God. And we can see that in these stories 
that some of these youth have been telling us about. Um, in David's anointment, in the story where he's fighting against Goliath, uh, there's my three minutes. Oops, I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, we can see that even though David is not a perfect human, he's still seeking after God. And that is why the Bible says that David is a man after God's own heart. So for me, for me to be a man after God's own heart and for you to be men and women after God's own heart, we need to seek to develop a relationship with him in the same way that David did. Even though we mess up, we accept God's forgiveness and we carry on growing just like you would in any other relationship with any other person. Um, so now we're going to watch a video of the young people sort of giving their answers to the question, what does it mean to be a person after God's own heart? To me, for me to be a man after God's own heart is to seek his will in everything that I do because there's things that I want, but more than wanting what I want, I want what God's want. If they're not the same, I'd rather seek God's will in my own. To make sure all my actions glorify God. It means that we are always protected by God and he will love us forever. Amen. Uh, it means to be putting God's will in front of your own and doing what God wants you to do rather than what you want to do. And if they match up, then that's even better. Uh, to be a man after God's own heart, to me, means living like Jesus did and always striving to follow his instructions. For me, it's living my life every day in the way that God has called me. To me, it means making God my main priority and living every day following him. Uh, to be a man after God's own heart, it means that no matter how many times I mess up and how many mistakes I make, I am always loved by God and he will always forgive me and be with me. For me, um, it's the understanding that God can see things in you that sometimes man cannot. To be someone after God's own heart means that um, you seek God in everything you do and you put his will before your own. To follow God in every step, to follow his plan for me, his desire for me, to grow spiritually and to go where he wants me to go, to where he instructs me, to where he leads me, to follow him in every step of the way. Hi everyone, good morning. Um, as Mason said, I'm very proud of all these guys who've done a fantastic job this morning. Um, and we're just gonna go into a time of reflection now. Um, so today we've spoken about um, David's life and David's heart and his faith for God and how God saw his heart, um, even though he messed up so many times, just as we do. Um, is there the picture of the swimming pool? Can anyone? No. Oh, okay, fab, thank you. Um, yeah, so this swimming pool represents God. Um, and we're going to reflect on where we are in this um, pool. So, um, yeah, as Mikey said, David had an incredible faith for God. Um, and I wonder where we are in our faith with God, in our walk with God. Um, so, yeah, if this swimming pool is God, where are we in this swimming pool? Are we sat on the sideline, maybe just watching maybe watching what happens maybe we're on Facebook we sometimes scroll past the services and we just watch or maybe we're some of those people who are just dipping their toes and maybe we turn up to church on a Sunday or if we're lucky we turn up to a house group throughout the week or are we those people who are full-on diving in for God and living every day um, for him um, yeah that's something between you and God but I think now is a great time for us to put our hearts right with God um for us to we're going to play a song in a second as this song plays um yeah it'll be a great time to set our hearts right with God ask him to fill us with the Holy Spirit and actually ask him to do an incredible work in us this week that maybe we go deeper in our faith than we ever have before um and we have a faith like David had um yeah if we can play the song <laughs> 